what can we expect from Asia given the underperformance that we continue to see? Is there more hope given the valuation levels right now or are we going to be uh, continue to be impacted by other factors like uncertainty in China? Yeah, you, you really have uh, two uh, elements when to, to understand the underperformance of Asia. First, you have Asia x China, which is underperforming the global market, and then uh, you have a specific a a China issue with China underperforming Asia. And, uh, and I think this is really the two, uh, the two broad issues that we have on, uh, on Asia. One is, uh, have we seen uh, the, the end of the reflection trade? And by this, I mean we have some signs that the 2022 earnings are starting to roll over. And certainly Taiwan and Korea are not going to be as big contributor to profit as they have been last year and this year. And so this is one concern which is making us rather cautious on Asia. And then the second one is China with the major policy shift that we've seen over the summer and the Evergrande crisis coming and some question mark whether it could be a systemic crisis. So we really have these two issues and uh, where, uh, how we position in Asia uh, is we find that among the large market, if we take uh, one of you looking at the valuation, looking at the potential, uh, that is mm. probably on China that we will see the most upside. Oh, you're expecting China to see more upside given the valuation levels from here? You have uh, today the, uh, the, the valuation in Asia, which are at a really um, very dispersed level, uh, with uh, India on the one hand and China on the other hand. Uh, MSCI China has become the lowest valued uh, equity market uh, in, uh, in Asia, actually. And so that's, uh, that's interesting because we had a premium uh, before the summer. So, uh, so this premium has become a discount. And uh, we start to see the risk perception, the risk premium uh, rising, uh, rising again. So, uh, so now uh, you have a number of uh, uh, serious risks uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in China, uh, especially uh, the one around some systemic risk with, uh, with Evergrande. But uh, we, uh, we believe that the market remains investable. Uh, that uh, we are not seeing a general assault on the private sector. Uh, and uh, if we have this, uh, this premise, then uh, this is one market uh, on which you could see uh, the uh, greater upside. And probably the greater downside as well. Huh? So, so this is uh, very much where uh, the volatility is going to be the, to be the highest. We did see today, though, uh, besides the difficulties around Evergrande, also Tencent are dropping out of the top 10 uh, most wealthy or non companies in the world by market cap. Uh, the trend line around all this regulatory risk does seem to be down. Why do you see that changing? Uh, y yes, so uh, you have uh, one part of the, uh, of the market. Uh, which is uh, in, the, in the heart of the storm and the, the internet uh, uh, tightening, uh, which uh, has intensified and uh, which, uh, which has some, uh, on, on which say, say you, you have some, uh, some headwind for probably the next couple of quarters, uh, whether it is uh, on the regulatory risk, whether it is on governance, and even some uh, cyclical headwind uh, which are impacting those, uh, those, those, uh, those names. So that's why uh, we see actually the upside to be more on the onshore than uh, on, the, uh, on the offshore part of the, of, the, of the market. And I think it's a little bit early for the bottom fishing uh, in, the, uh, in the internet space. Are there any other markets in emerging Asia that look more appealing than China right now? Uh, yeah, so uh, what, what, what we see in the, in, the, in the rest of Asia, well, you, you had this uh, on the performance uh, as the, uh, uh, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic has been some explanation. And uh, uh, also uh, what, we, uh, what we see is that the two uh, top star markets, uh, Taiwan and Korea in 2020 until the peak of 
February, uh, well, they are going to contribute less to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to earnings. Uh, and uh, uh, this is probably where uh, we take the, the more cautious view again and taking uh, a one-year one view. And, and then you have, uh, you have India, and uh, India uh, has, uh, um, well, against uh, all expectation, uh, has been uh, performing extremely well. Uh, you had this uh, uh, f do domestic uh, money uh, really being, uh, being active. Uh, and finally, the second wave, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, not uh, hit the economy uh, as we could have uh, fair. So, so this is explaining the, the strong performance. But now, uh, looking at where we stand in terms of the of the valuation, uh, re, re, both in terms of the history, in terms of other markets, uh, we cannot get more than a neutral view on that uh, on that market. Well, Frank, I just quickly want to get your thoughts on Japan as well, because the planets really seem to be aligning there, particularly in terms of PE ratios. Uh, what opportunities are you looking at in Japan? Well, you could uh, see both some uh, domestic catalyst and uh, what's going to come from, uh, from, the, from the external and especially from, uh, from the US. Uh, well, we, we've seen uh, the equity market has underperformed, and among the reasons you had uh, the state of emergency, the pandemic, and here, well, you could see some improvement uh, here. Uh, you could expect some uh, fiscal package to support the domestic economy ahead of the general election, where the size is not really something on which we, we, have, a, we have any indication. So these are some elements which could help to, to support the market. But uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the big story for me on, uh, on Japan, and uh, especially when we look at it from a, from a global uh, asset allocation point of view, uh, is what would happen uh, if you see the U.S. Treasury uh, yield rising and, uh, well, getting back to where they were uh, at the beginning of the year, let's say 1.7 percent, and at the same time the S&P being resilient. And if you see this combination, then the, probably the Japan equity market would be the one where uh, you want to be uh, in, uh, in, in Asia, because what what we've seen over the last three decades is this very strong uh, relationship with, uh, uh, with the U.S. Uh, yield and uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the bond market. And this is something that has continued over the year.